everybody. Welcome in to The Better Life with Dr. Pinkston. I am Dr. Marianne Pinkston and always happy to have you on board. And as usual, we're going to bring you a fantastic topic. This one is very near and dear to my heart and I'm sure very near and dear to many San Antonians here, uh, you know, since we do radio uh, for San Antonio and the surrounding area. But of course, we go national with the podcast. And I know this is a heavy American problem as well. But uh, talk a little bit about weight loss, nutrition and bariatric surgery, which is a kind of a very hidden option when it comes to losing weight, but a lot of myth. And we're going to break that today. I have Dr. Erica Laval, who's putting up her yes or this <laughs> there. We're going to do this. Uh, from Oregon, a doctor from Oregon who is board certified in metabolism. To make sure I say this right, tell me a little bit about you and you know how you came to this place. I read your story, an amazing story, but unlike not unlike many many people who are listening. Yeah, well, I would say when I was in undergrad, I knew I wanted to go into medical school, and um, you know, taking all those chemistry and pre-med classes can get kind of monotonous and you just kind of feel like you're in the slog, but you don't really feel like you're actually learning anything about medicine or life. And I took a nutrition class and that nutrition class saved my life. And with the whole nutrition track, I was able to take all the same biochemistry, organic chemistry, physics, it all counted towards my nutrition degree. It was a little bit higher level than what, you know, was standard for a dietetics degree, but man, I learned a lot. And so I graduated with um, nutrition and then a minor in psychology, which is also very applicable to all of the things that we do now in, you know, grown up life. And I went to medical school and in medical school, I was just so determined that I was going to become a preventative medicine doctor. Um, At the time, like Dr. Oz was starting to take off, right? And then the doctors on TV. And so you just saw this like hunger and appetite for um, really all of our, you know, communities getting excited about how to take care of themselves. But in medical school, they don't teach you anything about nutrition. I mean, I learned about um, nutritional deficiencies and I was just like, wow, this is this is BS. Yeah. So um, I learned that aspirin and statins was your primary mode of prevention. And I'm like, that's actually not true. Like, you know, pharmaceutical drugs aren't the only means to prevent disease. And so I just got a little disillusioned. I loved my surgery experience. Um, I felt like I was using my medical degree to its full potential. Mm -hmm. You know, it was kind of beyond pharmacology. You get to learn all the anatomy, plus the rapport you get to build with patients and that trust. And then that kind of instant gratification, which um, I'm a sucker for. (laughs) So (laughs) um, long story short, I did a bariatric surgery rotation. And my first day in clinic, my heart just grew so much. I mean, here was a patient population that was just also disillusioned by the medical yeah. establishment. Yeah, you know, very much so. um, our elementary school programs, our government and food guide pyramids. Mm-hmm. I mean, everybody's just like, I don't know how to eat. And then they, you know, are on social media and they think they're doing keto, but they're gaining weight and they're trying intermittent fasting, but they're like, you know, not really paying attention to all the other nutritional principles. And so they're still eating too much at night and, you know, all these different factors Mm -hmm. or they're skipping meals. And then they're, you know, more or less binging at night because they're so hungry because they can't feed themselves. And absolutely. So all these cycles. Yeah. And um, so, yeah, one day of clinic and I was like, I'm going to be a bariatric surgeon. This is the, I mean, wow. Like this, this is psychology. This is nutrition. This is surgery. And this is preventative medicine. And I think that's the myth I want to dispel is that bariatric surgery is not a last resort for many people. It is first line treatment. First line treatment for type two diabetes is now bariatric surgery. Wonderful. And it is more effective than the pharmaceutical medications for weight loss. We will talk about that. Um, And it just gives me so much hope when we interact with clients in this way and we teach them the nutritional basics and principles, Mm -hmm. um, they get to experience it in real time with all of our support. I have an amazing team of dietitians, an amazing team of behavioral health specialists, sleep medicine doctors, internal medicine doctors, endocrinologists who also Mm -hmm. are double boarded in obesity medicine. Um, And then they get to, the patients get to then share that experience with their families. 
So their husbands get healthier, their children get healthier, they get more active. Um, I mean, it is a pretty phenomenal field to be in. Yeah. It's kind of the uh, a domino effect of health, really. And, yes. you know, we do consider it a, a last resort. I think a lot of physicians do. I think it just in general, a lot of people do. And I, I can tell you how many times I've had patients in front of me who have considered it. You know, they've looked into it. They've thought about it. But say, you know, I just I think I need to do it on my own. And, you know, they see it as a cop out. So how do you dispel? That's a huge myth to to overcome. That's almost every single person I talk to. How do you dispel that myth? Well, I think that comes into, you know, marketing. So there's all of these ads and marketing, you know, mm-hmm. tabloids, you know, in the, the newspaper stand at the checkout at the grocery store. It's always this, you can do it fast, quick. You could do it on your Thank own. You. Lose 10 pounds in a week, blah, blah, blah. And so mm-hmm. we're just sold a very false reality of what real weight loss is and what taking care of your body is. Right. So I do think that there are plenty of individuals out there who really put their nose to the book, learned a lot and transformed their life. And over maybe a year, maybe five years, we're able to lose a considerable amount of weight and keep it off there. It, that is a reality, yes. but does it happen quickly? Hell no. no. And then also what are the internal tools? What are those psychology mechanisms, the behaviors, you know, a lot of I patients. So even if you have bariatric surgery, you're not exempt from gaining your weight back. Right. You That's need true. full support. You need full, again, commitment, you know? So what is willpower? Willpower is commitment, commitment to choices, commitment to alignment with your sense of self. Wow. So like, it just, it, it takes the whole, whole picture. So I think a lot of times people just view it as a last resort because they want to, we also experience a lot of shame in this industry. Absolutely. Thanks. Um, You know, the very word obesity means to eat, to be fat. And that came from the 17th century. And that's around the same time that the BMI started being calculated by a skinny white French man, might I add. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> Which I just find that so hilarious right. yeah. because so, here mm, we are in America a... and we're a melting pot, right? right? Even if you are Caucasian, you have German, you have Norwegian, you have all these different you know, things. But if you're not Caucasian, whoa. And also that BMI st- you know, s- mm-hmm. statistics was only done exclusively on French people. Wow. There you go. So it does not... It does, does not a lot. extrapolate. It does mm-hmm. says a lot. And yeah. so, yes, medicine is still using it. But I mean, anymore, I think there was just a recent article by um, the uh, American Medical Association actually begging uh, the medical societies to completely go away with it. Good. And I think that that actually would be very beneficial because we end up, again, trying to put everybody in the same box. Absolutely. You said something very point. I loved it. And that just little light bulb goes off whenever, whenever people say something brilliant like this, that about willpower, mm-hmm. willpower is commitment. Mm-hmm. It doesn't mean that you get it right every time and you resist everything, you know, perfectly that you're some, you know, grand being that has figured it all out and no. can't, no, I, I can't, it is commitment. It's just the commitment to change your life and do your best to change your life. And so it's very, very important. I, you know, people talk about willpower all the time. And that's where the shame that you mentioned is also built in. Because if you don't resist and lose weight and do this all quickly, then you failed mm-hmm. miserably. So, you know, that's something I feel like you address a lot mm-hmm. in your clinic, I'm sure. And on your podcast, yeah. too. I know yeah. you have a podcast. Yeah. I mean, there's just, again, the the shame that gets compounded when somebody's given a label of obesity and then knowing the context, the actual semantic context that it means to eat, to be fat. Yeah. There's a huge, 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 huge uh, cultural phenomenon here about, uh, we call it weight bias. Mm -hmm. And so people have their own prejudices against themselves. And regardless of what's going on, they even hold those prejudices against other people. And it's just this very, you know, kind of muddy, implicit kind of thing that goes on. It's very subconscious. And it's just how humans have compartmentalized and treated each other at a very immature level. (laughs) 
Yeah, true. <laughs> so I'm here being like, okay, let's raise our vibration a little bit. Yeah. Let's be a little more mature. Let's treat each other with more kindness, more humanness, and let's teach each other how do we stay committed to our bodies. Because when we are committed to taking care of ourselves, then everything else falls into place. It does. But how do people go so off the mark? You know, I know stress and I, I mentioned, I read on your on your website, mm-hmm. a lot of great information there. We'll, we'll give everybody the website shortly and stay tuned because we're going to have a second show on all this because it's so important. But, you know, I how do you address the stress, the lack of sleep, the things that drive us to eat so poorly? Because people cannot overcome that. That is what 2%, I think, of people actually lose weight and and keep it off long term and get healthy long term. So, you know, how do we overcome 98% of the, the, you know, world that can't, you know, America that can't eat right and and do right by themselves? Yeah. I mean, I think there's two ways to kind of approach it. Um, Number one, Exercise is the best antidepressant in stress, stress response. But I'm too tired. I don't have enough time. Yeah. Well, so then those are excuses and that's Mm -hmm. somebody who's not committed, you know? So it's like, so you're either committed to the whole thing or Mm -hmm. maybe you're still in your contemplation phase. Right. So so stages of change or readiness for change. That's actually something I learned back in my dietetics training, and but there's always this contemplation, consideration, you know, denial mm-hmm. or actual readiness. Right. And so before we take anybody to bariatric surgery, we're really trying to like ascertain like, okay, where in the spectrum do you fall? Thank you. Um, because we're careful to not just operate on somebody next week. We really want this to be a permanent change and we want you to really feel committed to it. And then at the same time, it can take four to six months before we actually get you on the surgery schedule because we're working with you in this dynamic. It's practice, it's commitment and practice and it's consistency. It's not perfection. And then after surgery, there's a lot of post-operative care. So we offer post-operative care regularly for up to a full year. And then we ask them to come back annually thereafter. Now that's in my clinic. Um, In my online practice, I've taken a really strong personal interest because of my gut microbiome um, experience and uh, knowledge in the autonomic nervous system. Yes. So the vagus nerve, which it exits the brain controls how we perceive our environment. So yeah. even like right now, as we're talking, we're listening, we're using our vocal cords, our voices are soft, right? I'm smiling right. at you. So we are in a state of parasympathetic activation because mm-hmm. we are humans co-regulating each other's nervous systems. So when you think about stress and you think about all of those people who suffer from obesity, um, being heavy, um, there is oftentimes very traumatic, adverse childhood experiences that Absolutely. compound their early childhood. So we learn maladaptive behaviors, maladaptive being not committed towards health, but committed towards self soothing, right? Self medicating, self medicating. Um, and, and there's so many, so many layers because sometimes subconsciously our bodies want to grow to protect ourselves from physical harm. Right. That's like an add yourself against yeah, the you anger and pad yourself, exactly. trauma of it all. Yeah. And mm-hmm. then, you know, likewise, sometimes our stress you know, can also promote emotional eating. And sure. that's often left over from an early childhood. Maybe a parent didn't listen to you. Maybe a parent didn't want to listen to you. So they gave you snack food to keep you quiet. We're doing that now as parents with iPads. Oh, thank you. you. Know, here's the iPad, you know, so it's just True. parenting takes a lot of work. You don't yeah. have to pass a test to become a parent. And it doesn't mean we need to like be upset at our parents, but there's a lot of forgiveness that needs to take place. And there's also a lot of like, again, mature perspectives now that you're grown up so that you can retrain and reparent your grown up Absolutely. And that happens so much. I see so many of my parents, you know, their their children, you know, eat nothing but nuggets and and French fries. And they say, but they, they don't like anything else. And I'm like, you're the parent. 
you put food down in front of them and tell them if they're hungry, they will eat that. If not, they will go to bed hungry and be consistent about that. Guess what? They're going to eat it. And exactly. it's a hard line to take. And I understand that, but it really is just truth. And, yeah. and that's, you know, when you've got 10 minutes in a room with a patient, you've got to get to the truth sometimes. But I, yeah. I want to talk about these stages too of change. This is something else that's very important. You just mentioned so many things. There's no way we're going to get all this in, but um, we're going to take a break here in just a minute. I do want people to know where to find you. So give us some information about where you are and what you're doing and where we can find you. Yeah. Um, I am on YouTube under Erica Lavella, and that is where I teach a four hour, four part um, workshop about the gut microbiome, how that impacts body weight, the stress connection. Yes. Again, we're going to have a separate show to talk all about uh, We're going to talk that. Absolutely. Um, and then I have joined up with one of my dietitians that I work with clinically. Her name is Bonnie Buckingham, and we've created Art of Bariatrics. And so Art of Bariatrics is an online community, courses, meal plans, coaching platform right. for this level of yes. really thoughtful functional nutrition for the bariatric patient. And bariatric does not always mean surgery. It means Correct. nutrition and weight control, yes. right? So yeah. I mean, anybody who would be taking Ozempic would be following our bariatric okay. diet Thank plan. Thank you. Absolutely. You know, anybody on Manjaro would be following the same thing. Yes. Um, yes. Anybody with type 2 diabetes who wants to lose 100 pounds on their own would also be very keen to follow our meal plans Absolutely. and take our courses. So yes, and I would agree. That is artofbariatrics.com, which Correct. all of this information will be found on uh, my website as well. I'll feature uh, her under guest highlights. So go to drpbetterlife.com and you'll find all of my previous podcasts and links to all the different platforms and social media and whatnot. I will definitely highlight Dr. Lavella there. And so we will, uh, we're going to take a short break. I do want to say something very quickly about a great sponsor of mine, Pinnacle Research. And uh, you've heard me say it a million times that uh, you can get a free fibro scan and to evaluate for fatty liver, which is a part of obesity and a huge in South Texas. So go to pinnacleresearch.com. We're going to take a break and be right back. Fatty liver is linked to two different situations, alcohol and diabetes or obesity. In both cases, patients can have no symptoms. In the United States and in particular, Texas, the most common cause of liver disease in general is non-alcoholic alcoholic fatty liver, again, associated with overweight, obesity, and or diabetes. Additional risk factors include high cholesterol, high blood pressure, Hispanic ethnicity, and postmenopausal status. At Pinnacle Clinical Research, we offer a quick, non-invasive, ultrasound-based screening assessment called FibroScan. This test is done at no cost to you and we do not take insurance. The test will measure the fat and stiffness in your liver and state your risk and development of fatty liver disease. You will meet with a provider immediately following your scan to go over your results. If you're interested in getting more information on your liver health, please call 210-982-0320 and schedule your fibro scan today. We are conveniently located in the Medical Center at 5109 Medical Drive. We are back. I'm talking with Dr. Erica Lavella from Oregon. Well, she's not burning alive up there, but uh, with all this heat that we've had. But uh, we have been talking about bariatric uh, surgery, bariatric nutrition, two different things. But I know you want to dispel a myth uh, really quickly about bariatric surgery. Um, what uh, What is something that you face most often and, and hear and try yeah. to? Yeah, well, I think, you know, earlier we were talking about it being a last resort. And mm -hmm. I think that sometimes the last resort mentality comes from the fact that, you know, 30, 40 years ago, bariatric surgery had a very high mortality rate, Absolutely. had a very high complication rate. Um, and that is in the era of open surgery. So if you can imagine a person with a large body being cut from right underneath their breast and diabetic all the way, and yeah, and yeah all the way all. down below their um, belly button. And then again, at that time, what was the, you know, major diabetes treatment only insulin, right? So insulin is such a weight gaining hormone. And so anyway, it's just, it gets really, mm -hmm. really tricky. So the complication rates at that time were really high. 
people get hernias, they'd get blood clots. We didn't have good blood thinners back then. And it, it was just perceived really scary. Even amongst other doctors, people still remember that era of bariatric surgery. Doctors very much so. And so it's, I I run into this situation Mm -hmm. a lot where a patient will tell me they know a family member that had it, they Mm -hmm. want it, but their primary care doctor is actually trying to talk them out of it. Right. And so I'm like, oh, wow, it's just interesting. Everybody has their own biases. Yeah. Everybody has their own experiences. And so, um, you know, nothing's all true. Yeah. Right. It's so Isn't, safe. Yes. It's like so, it, it, you use Da Vinci maybe now or, you know, I use the or, Da Vinci. See? I actually discharge my patients home same day. Now they don't even have to Amazing. stay the night in the hospital. Amazing. Um, and yeah, so very small incisions, um, very minimal pain. They're off all pain medicine within three to four days. Yeah. Um, and it's safer than an elective gallbladder surgery. Yeah. Thank you. Very, and not painful, really. Uh, there's, no. you know, an, a good incision where, you know, you have to remove the stomach or, or you know, uh, contents of, of mm-hmm. the body there, but it is otherwise really not very painful. You're back on your feet very quickly. I think the main thing is just dealing with the big change after that of, you know, you've relied on food for so long, self-medicating, and now... <laughs> You, you can't do that anymore. Yeah. So you have to be very ready. We, we talked a little bit, we've only got about five minutes left, but we, we talked a little bit about meeting people where they are and that there's are stages of change and not everybody's ready for the true commitment of weight loss in general. And forget just bariatric surgery, but true weight loss in general. And that it is a huge commitment. We've got too many quick fixes and we're in quick fix, quick fix mode all the time. Is that something you battle a lot of? Oh, yeah. (laughs) I'm sure. That was a Um, dumb question. Yeah. (laughs) Well, so, you know, I would say, again, setting the expectation pretty Mm -hmm. early and like the surgical consult's really important for me. So I try to find out where the patient is. And if I find out, sometimes they get pushy, right? So like as soon as they realize that they've committed to surgery, they want it. They want it then. They want it next week. Absolutely. And then they get a little testy with the whole process. And they'll even say things like, I don't understand why I have to jump through all these hoops. And I'm like, thank you. That's why you're here. Yeah. I'm like, this, <laughs> this is the work, right. you know, like, right. so we describe surgery as a tool. Um, right. And my old partner, bless his heart. He used to say, we're doing stomach surgery. We ain't doing brain surgery. <laughs> and really? I just thought that was so funny. And again, <laughs> what I remind people is like, your stomach is actually the first digestive organ that is directly communicating to your brain. Right. And all those hormones. I mean, we're going to talk next time about all the medical weight loss stuff and the microbiome. But, you know, and and this is why bariatric surgery is metabolic surgery is because when we either alter absorption through the duodenum, we dramatically change the sensitivity of insulin. Right. And so that's why gastric bypass can cure type two diabetes. Like like overnight, like you get the surgery, you leave without insulin, without, in most cases, without drugs to to treat that. Yes. It's amazing. Yes. Um, And then with the sleeve gastrectomy, I'd say the sleeve gastrectomy acts more like a more potent ozempic. Right. Where it's a GLP-1 and the GIP um, hormone agonist. But essentially, your body is so much better at burning through carbohydrate stores. Like that hormone that pulls carbohydrate stores out of your liver and out of your muscles is just always active. So by having that active, you don't feel hungry. And by you not feeling hungry and you having a small stomach, then you are very satisfied off of your smaller portions. And so linking all these things together, it is brain surgery. And you do have to just be aware. You have to be aware of how your body's changing. And as long as you can clear the air from stress and subconscious beliefs and of, you know, patterns, which is hard. You might have to do all the work simultaneously, but I mean, magic will happen and people do report a major mental change and so much growth because of it. Such Um, a great process, such a a revealing self, self self-revealing and self-learning and awareness. And, and it's, you know, weight loss when you do finally get to the point where you can and you do it the right way, whatever way you choose, whatever tool you use. Mm -hmm. So people don't understand sometimes when you're so overweight, you have to use several different tools to get where you need to go. 
all always it's in your control. Always it's you doing the work, no matter what tool you choose. So if you choose bariatric surgery, that is not a cop out. It is something it's a tool that you're using to get to a means uh, to an end, you know, to lose the weight loss. When you're finally ready for that, it, it's a wonderful process. And so we've got about a minute and a half. I want you to tell me one more time where we can find your information. <laughs> yes. Um, artofbariatrics.com. That's where I do all of my weight loss work. Um, we have online courses, meal plans, and great um, some coaching support. Yes. And then um, this will probably be more applicable for the next show. But as we talk more about the stress Mm -hmm. microbiome food connection. Um, I published a four hour workshop. I was invited to speak on how nutrition impacts chronic pain Mm -hmm. and got standing ovations from a crowd of about 200 people. And I was like, wow, everybody is hungry for this linking Yes, Because I would say I was never taught to link all these systems together. It's right. just through my own body awareness and body experience. Yeah. I went a little deeper and started linking them all together. So uh, that's how we system, do it. Nervous it crazy? system, neuroregulation. Yep. It is crazy. We are yeah. not taught. We are not taught in medical school. All the things that I know and did and losing weight. Now I teach to patients whatnot. This was not taught in medical school, folks. Listen, we've got a few seconds left. Please visit drpbetterlife.com. You can get all of her information and all the links to previous videos and stay tuned because we are going to talk a lot more about this. We will see you on the next one.